Uh, we have an exciting keynote speaker, the director of Department of Rehab, Joe Xavier. Joe has 36 years of experience in business and public administration, as well as many years participating in advocacy and community organization. Uh, he understands the challenges and opportunities available to individuals with disabilities and the services required to maximize an individual's full potential. Joe also believes in the talent and potential of individuals with disabilities. He believes in pursuing excellence through continuous improvement and preserving the public trust through compassionate, responsible provision of services. So please join me in welcoming Joe Xavier. All right, well, thank you. Um, let me just first start by sharing with all of you that it's um, a great honor to be here and to be a part of your conversation and contribute um, to the discussion. Um, just applaud the leadership of the State Disability Advisory Committee, um, as well as the Disability Advisory Committees at all, across all the departments that uh, help improve the opportunity for individuals with disabilities um, to go to work in their various departments, um, as well as to have promotional opportunities within um, those departments. And um, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge and uh, send our thoughts and best wishes to everyone who's been impacted by the fires, the heat waves, the power outages, um, the bad air quality, oh, and not to mention COVID-19, um, amongst many other things that we're all dealing with. So I trust everybody is staying as safe as you can. Um, these are challenging times that we're all living through, um, and we will get through them uh, nonetheless. So this morning, I wanted to provide some perspective to you um, from the state level on the telework opportunity to share with you how Department of Rehabilitation approaches both telework and reasonable accommodations. But more importantly than just me talking to all of you, I'm welcome the opportunity to get into a conversation with you, whether it's through a question and answer format or however you choose to really hear from you and engage in, with you in those areas that are of interest and concern to you. Um, as part of the context, let me share a couple of things around COVID-19 that I think are very important um, to the discussion that I just described. One of the things that we know is that to have meaningful change, you really need to disturb the present. I think we would all agree that the present has been disturbed, significantly so. Although COVID-19 did not create the challenges that we're facing, um, it really has exacerbated a lot of these challenges, right? Uh, so um, Dr. Galley from our agency often says that COVID-19 both unmasked and is an accelerant to what was present. Didn't necessarily create other than illness and death, um, what we experience today. We know that for example, um, many of the things like uh, telework, but you think about how that's been accelerated in ways that we had not conceived of, both by um, COVID-19, as well as the other um, issues that we have been facing. Think about uh, retail and how much that has escalated in the online world. Think about education um, that has you know, taken place. So why am I describing all that? Because this really provides a monumental opportunity for some really significant change um, within the state, um, how the state does business and the state's workforce, right? And if you keep thinking about how the state um, has been doing uh, accommodations and think about the accommodations that people are getting now for online education that they were not getting. I think in some ways you guys have already experienced and I think we'll continue to see how even providing accommodations for those individuals who are remote working. So the idea here is not that we just do this within COVID-19, but we do this beyond COVID-19. 
And I think it's important that we recognize that the change that we have seen in the last four or five months would otherwise have taken five, 10, 15 years to make this kind of change, right? So what does telework look like from the state perspective? That, you know, all of our departments, collectively the administration, what is that looking like? Well, we already know that it has already resulted in greater flexibility for the state's workforce. We know that in some areas it's increased productivity. We know that it has made us much more resilient um, to the emergency. So our ability to continue providing services and to do our work has really um, changed with what has already taken place. Um, we know that it's reduced the state's carbon footprint. So think about all the folks that were previously commuting to and from work, um, not just within the state, but even across all sectors who are now not doing that and how that is impacting the state's carbon footprint. We also know that the state has really looking at how um, we continue that work um, in a more broader sense. So it's not just what we've done to this point, but when state starts to look at all its leased facilities, how do we um, now restack those leases in a way that reduces the brick and mortar costs for the state, right? We know that there's an opportunity and a belief that this shift to telework is going to improve the opportunity for uh, recruitment. So people who otherwise might not come to work for this state will have an opportunity to do so. And if I were to speak specifically to individuals with disabilities, for many, <clears throat> they're going to have an opportunity to go to work um, where otherwise they may not have had that opportunity. We know transportation often is a major barrier to employment as an example. So now people that have the opportunity to work remotely are not dealing with transportation as a barrier that needs to be mitigated and noted to go to work. And so then of course, what all this means is how do we really look at um, making sure that telework is not just here today, but that it continues in this fashion. And all of you would have received a letter from Secretary of GovOps, uh, Yolanda Richardson, that really laid out some of these things. So I'm really highlighting with you something that you've seen, but I think it's really important that we all understand what's the context and what's the framework that the broader state is looking at these issues. What's the lens that they're looking through? All right, how does the Department of Rehabilitation look at reasonable accommodations? And how does the Department of Rehabilitation look at <coughs> increasing the workforce um, by of people with disabilities within the state's workforce, right? How do we get more people with disabilities employed by the state? First of all, we have a cultural commitment to um, both diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and I'm not, I'm not saying that other departments don't, I'm just saying this is how we at the Department of Rehabilitation are really focusing on this. We, we have, and we are very intentional about ensuring that disability and inclusion is visible and present at all levels of the organization. That's on our executive team, that's on our senior leadership team, that is across all of our workforce. So 30% of our workforce identifies as having a disability, 40% of our leadership identifies as having a disability. And we do not view reasonable accommodations as a privilege here at the department. We view it in the same way that um, we would view providing somebody with a telephone or a desk or a restroom. It's the same kind of mindset that we apply to accommodations. It is something that is needed and is appropriate and is required for individuals to carry out their duties and, and perform their functions in, in an effective way. 
And when we think about that, we look at it both from a digital, from a programmatic and a physical accessibility. So it's not just on one end of that that we look at that. We look at it in that wide spectrum. And we start with a premise that accessibility is not a step or an action. It's an ongoing commitment. It's an ongoing expectation. It's an ongoing behavior by all of us. In other words, it's not one and done. It's a repeated, reoccurring, adjusting um, as is needed as you know, individuals continue in the workforce. And we embrace the value of making it accessible up front. So let me use digital accessibility as an example. When a document is created, no matter where it's created in the organization, right from the outset, we are saying that document must be accessible and must be created in a way that individuals who are blind can access it, individuals who have cognitive disabilities can access it, individuals that have um, any other kind of limitation that they need to be accommodated for, that that document is prepared. Again, that is the same for both programmatic and physical access, of course. And the other thing that I think is important that we do here at the department is the invisible, the hidden disability, right? We need to recognize that we, when somebody is having a heart attack, we embrace that person. We rush to them and we render aid. When somebody is having um, a psychotic episode, we shun them and we run away from them, call the police. And that's not okay. We need to embrace an individual that has a psychotic episode in the same way that we embrace somebody that has is having a heart attack. And we need to make sure that uh, we foster an environment that is sufficiently safe for an individual to disclose an invisible disability. They need to feel comfortable that that will not be held against them, that they will in fact receive appropriate supports. But that's not good enough to just do that. We also have to prepare and support our management in their ability and in having the tools and having the resources to both understand and effectively engage an individual with an invisible disability. So when we talk about disability, um, it's important to know that um, what we are really thinking about is it's individualized to every person, right? So no two blind people experience blindness in the same way. So we start by saying, what is it that Joe, um, as a result of his blindness needs, and we individualize to that basic need? We do that even with assistive technology. So as an example, my preferred um, and my method of communication is through a screen reader, meaning instead of writing, um, I'm, having, uh, I'm using a screen reader. Some people might use Braille. So we start with what is it that works for that individual on, on all spectrums, and that's how we decide what is the appropriate accommodation. The other thing that we do here at the department is we, when reasonable, right, when it's feasible, we defer to what works for that individual. And let me give you a real example of what that might look like. So I use a screen reader um, and there might be two or three screen readers on the market. If I am um, somebody who has learned and has effectively mastered the use of JAWS as an example, regardless of what we as an organization may have available, if JAWS is what works for me, then JAWS is what we want to provide. And a, a couple of reasons for that is that it really minimizes the learning curve and it leverages that person's skill set that they've already developed to use that assistive technology. The other thing that we pay close attention to is, you know, there's always a lot of conversation around the cost of, a of an accommodation. 
But there's uh, another element that we really pay close attention to. So yeah, while it's true that my reasonable accommodations might cost, you know, a couple of thousand dollars. Um, sometimes we get caught up in that couple thousand dollars. But what I often say to folks is, how much do we pay that person to sit around in salary if they're not able to effectively do their job? And that cost is much more significant than the cost of the accommodation. So we, we really coach um, the folks that are involved um, in the procurement of accommodations to recognize that the cost of accommodation is not nearly the cost associated with um, somebody who was not able to perform their duties, not to mention the social, the personal and the professional impact on the individual because they don't have that cost there. So um, let's talk about disabilities for a second. So, you know, obviously our mission is to provide the programming and the service that is necessary for somebody to keep a job, to get a job, um, or to advance in employment, right? So we very much look at that um, as not only um, our mission when we're working with our consumers, but that's also part of how we look at the state as an employer that includes us as a department as an, an employer. So part of that is to do some of the work that we're doing with the diversity task force, the governor's diversity task force, an element of that is how do we increase the employment opportunity for people with disabilities within the state's workforce. Many of you will be familiar with LEAP. That's one such vehicle. And we're looking at other strategies to um, employ and deploy to improve the opportunity for people with disabilities to go to work in all of the state departments across the state. All right, so, so let's talk a little bit about um, telework and how that has affected people with disabilities um, in our department, and I'm going to guess that by extension across the other departments. So first of all, let's start with um, the telework policy, right? But I'm, what I want to start with here is by saying that this information that I'm sharing is from how we approach this, but I, you know, I largely think you guys are probably going to have um, experiences that are very relatable to this. So we start with the policy that um, we've had in place for a long time that individuals do have um, the opportunity to work remotely. So the ability for individuals with disabilities to work remotely did not start with COVID-19 for us. That has been in place for quite some time. And so what we do is we provide the assistive technology that is necessary for the individuals um, to do so. So in our case, we have greatly benefited from the fact that um, working remotely was an expectation that included people with disabilities for quite some time. So they have both the assistive technology and we have the infrastructure in place that allows that to take place. So I'm able, as an example, to sit at my desk at home and be connected um, to the workplace in the same way that everybody else is um, and frankly, it would be hard for anybody to tell which computer I'm sitting at when it comes for my ability to do my job here at the department. And we also, of course, um, look at what are the things that um, are challenging as people move into that place, right? So in some cases, individuals may not have had the technology. So we've been working to provide those individuals with that technology as, you know, as we have, you know, progressed and increased into telework. There were some classifications as an example, you know, people that were doing more of the administrative functions that may not have had um, all of the technology they needed to telework. We have been providing that to them so they have the opportunity to do so, whether they have or do not have a disability. But then the other thing that comes to play is what are the supports necessary for people to work remotely. So think about um, support services assistance general, support services assistance interpreting. We continue to make those supports available to individuals um, who need them, even if they are teleworking. Um, and so that is something that we're paying close attention to. And of course, each of those comes 
you know, from a little bit of a different perspective. The other thing that we're paying close attention to is the workplace socialization. Um, workplace socialization is a very e- a key aspect of our culture, of all of our cultures across our organizations. And it's something that we cannot lose as we change to working in a remote environment, right? The other thing that I can tell you is that our experiences and our practices will continue to evolve. Why is that? Well, we've learned a great deal as we've done more of a mass migration to telework. And as we've as we learn, we'll continue to adapt our system, our practice, our processes to ensure that we're benefiting from you know those experiences and you know about what works and what doesn't work. So are employees with disabilities having their needs met while teleworking? Well, again, we individualize to that person. So what somebody needs in a telework status if they're blind is going to vary from person to person. It depends on um, the job that they're performing, right? What are the duties that they're performing? And how are how is performing of those duties in a remote setting different than the face-to-face setting? So we look at that very closely and we individualize to that. Um, And again, I already mentioned, you know, providing that assistive technology. So think about, um, for me as somebody who's blind, I may need somebody um, that reads materials for me. So the question now becomes, if I'm teleworking, how does that materialize? Well, things that we would need to consider as an example would be, are those hard copy materials? Are those digital materials? If they're digital, the approach to having somebody read those to me might be different than if they're hard copy. For example, if they're digital, that person might also be able to be sitting at home and read those to me. Or um, if they're hard copy, maybe that person doesn't need to come to the office or maybe we need to get the materials to that person so they're able to read those to me. So that's just one example of how we individualize the supports that we provide um, to that to the person. Same thing for interpreting services. So if an individual requires an interpreter, can they use um, remote, you know, whether it's through Teams or Zoom or video phones? So what is the, the condition, what is the setting that they need to provide interpreting for, and what's the way that that can be, you know, accommodated? Should employees that are teleworking have accommodations set up at their homes? So we always start what helps that individual perform their duties. So if it helps that individual performs their duties, the answer then is yes, we do make it available. Um, The question that we often ask is, was that individual working previously or remotely? The answer to that is yes. And the question is, so what has changed? right? If the answer to that is no, then what is needed for them to be able to provide that? We have uh, provided um, sit-stand desks, chairs, um, ergonomic chairs, scanners, uh, technologies, the whole range of whatever is necessary for that individual to function remotely is the approach that we take in terms of providing um, that accommodation in the telework setting. So um, I'm going to stop chatting so we can get into conversation, but let me, what what I want to do is just um, close this up with a couple of thoughts. First of all, again, I just applaud the work of the State Disability Advisory Committee, as well as the Disability Advisory Committees for the work you're doing. It is important work. You should know that, and I would just encourage you um, to keep it up. Nobody said it was easy. Nobody said it was painless. Um, And if it was either of those, probably not worth doing. So, yeah, sometimes you are going to face challenges and you can't shy away from that as you do the work that you're doing. I certainly welcome you guys sharing um, our practices with anyone else. And, you know, to the extent that you do and other um, folks within your organizations have an interest in conversations with us, we welcome that. Whether it be individuals who are procuring accommodations whether it be individuals 
um, in our Office of Civil Rights. That, you know, we're open to sharing our practices with anyone because it really does benefit um, the, the individuals with disabilities in the workplace, not just those that are there today, but those that will have an opportunity to go to work, you know, for the state tomorrow. So we also want to point out that you have the assistive technology um, directory, which is um, available as a resource to all departments in terms of providing both um, goods and services to support reasonable accommodations. And I really am um, welcome hearing from you on what are the things that you are um, experiencing, what are the areas that you know, as a Department of Rehabilitation, with our role in the state that you think we should also help give attention to, whether it's both from a policy or a systems perspective. Um, welcome hearing, you know, how individuals with telework, uh, disabilities might be impacted by telework. What are some of the areas um, that would be beneficial to hear about there? So, um, what are the voices, what are the considerations that we should be including in policy um, and planning is, you know, we do some of the work that I've already described that has taken place. So I'm going to stop there. Um, love to open this up to um, conversation, to hearing from all of you. Um, and uh, just let's just get into a conversation. So uh, Bobby and Eduardo, I'll, I'll kick this back over to you and uh, love to pick up a conversation on the on what I've shared and any interest that you have. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Joe. That was so informative and useful to our members. And we thought it was beneficial to simply start with the chat questions and then open it up for the verbal inquiries that may come in, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Great. So Susan uh, is going to help us provide, uh, present those questions that came through the chat. Go ahead, Susan. Hi, Joe. So um, we had two uh, main questions that came in. We had one that came in that was um, asking from Kim Liu, can DOR share their telework policy with SDAC members? Our department has established a work group to address teleworking that will include policy writing. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. So we'll put that we'll, down. We'll, we we'll get it over to you folks and you guys can decide how to distribute it. And then um, Rami had a question, which I think you cover a little bit, but it was, uh, or you covered to some extent, but do people with disability need a reasonable accommodation to be able to telework? Is telework limited? So for us, no. Telework is not limited because somebody has a disability. What, what decides whether a person can or cannot telework is their, their duties. Right? Are they performing duties that can only be done, um, you know, on the, in the, uh, being actually in the workplace, or are they performing duties that can be done remotely? Nine out of ten times, it's a combination of both. Right, and so we approach telework that way. It's not based on disability itself. And then, Joe, we had a, um, a comment from David Meyer that said that dep that depends on the individual department policy on telework. It has been coming up in some recent EEO complaints, and we have we at the EEO office don't have a clear answer yet. Hopefully, the complaint um, the complaint will assist in clarifying the issue. Um, and as my uh, commentary, yeah, I've heard some concerns um, from people uh, at my last agency where they were saying, you know, trying to get accommodations at home um, was a bit of a struggle. I, I mean, I think that is correct. I hear, you know, again, what I shared with all of you is how the Department of Rehabilitation is approaching, right? So clearly, we're not the ones setting policy for other departments, um, but we are willing to do is to the extent that another department is wanting some conversation about how we're approaching it, we are totally open to that. We're not dictating, hey, Department X, you should do, do it this way, okay? Um, because we don't know what the environment is there. We don't know, you know, all of what's at play in that department. And, you know, frankly, it's overstepping our role a bit. Okay, so just as we share our telework policy, yes, but that's DORs, 
right? That's not your departments. You know, the question is, you know, when you guys get our telework policy, then what? Karen asked, would we go to the employee's home to help assist with issue in the home, or would it depend on each agency's policy? Well, I, Which I, th- I, think, I think you were kind of alluding to that each agency has to set their own policy. Yeah, I mean, they, they clearly have to set their own policy. And I want to I want to so always a, another issue. Um, it should be standardized, but isn't. I want to just put a question mark on that for you folks, um, for all of us to think about. So it's, it's enticing for things to be consistent and standardized. And I, and I agree with that to the extent that that is used as a floor and not a ceiling. And the reason I say that is I keep, it's keeping in mind no two individuals are the same. No two individuals experience the same disability in the same way. And so when we start to standardize this, we start to eliminate the basic principle of individualizing to the person. So it's much more important to me to start with the person first and then say, and what do we need to do so this will work? Because what you do for Joe, you may not need to do for anybody else and vice versa. So um, Joe, we have um, Jennifer asking, will CaliJAR have a standardized policy that the state agency can use an example to proceed with their telework policies? I don't know that it's um, CaliJAR. I think uh, DGS is the one that is working on a statewide policy. Um, And my understanding is that is likely to be a model policy that departments will then um, used to build on. Um, you know, clearly we're all um, revisiting our policies as we've moved into this arena. Departments that already had policies in place, um, you know, have a start point. But, you know, even us, we're having to think um, in some ways about, you know, that policy and how effective is it in today's real experiences. It's Eduardo. Okay. Mr. Xavier, um, I am sight impaired. I am also a former um, department rehab client. So, and I do appreciate everything that your department does for the disabled community. I, my own experience was very positive. So without changing the subject, I'd like to get your take on how do you feel if, for example, I went to an interview and I don't mark down on the application that I need accommodations and I don't let the folks interviewing me know ahead of time and I just show up with my own adaptive technology and my own magnifying glass and I don't say anything. Do you think that's kind of deceptive to the people that are interviewing you or um, I've done that to show, you know what, I'm going to show that um, I might have a disability, but I can do it on my own without anyone's help. That's that's kind of the point the, the point that I try to make when I've gone to interviews. I'm not going to tell them I need accommodation. I'm just going to bring my own. And if they feel I was deceitful, well, then that's their issue. I'd like to get your take on that. So the issue of disclosure um, is a longstanding conversation um, across all disabilities. Um, here's my personal and a view, and here's my approach to it. And and then I'll let you and others, you know, judge that against or hold that up against your your own approach, and you know, take it with a grain of salt. Okay. Um, yes, for some individuals, like you're you're describing, there are things that. Um, you don't need accommodation for it, so it's a non-issue. Or you can demonstrate um, in an interview setting that you just using a magnification, you get to go. In my case, if I know that they're going to be doing um, a written interview and I don't tell them in advance that I am not able to simply sit at any computer, I've not given them a fair opportunity to accommodate me. And so if I want a fair opportunity for them to accommodate, you know, my ability um, to write, 
because I can write just fine. I'm just not going to do it in a traditional way at any old computer. Um, you know, I'm going to have that conversation up front. Um, in my case, there's no pretending that I'm blind. The minute I open, they open the door and see me, they're going to see my white cane and they're going to see me maybe even potentially not looking in the right way until there's some audio, audible cues to be the key in on. So I, I think you have to consider your own circumstances, your own unique um, needs that are unique to each person. Um, for me, um, I want a partnership between myself and that interview panel so they can see my best. Um, and then, you know, when that happens, then I feel like I'm going to have a fair shot um, at demonstrating the talent they're looking for and being given that opportunity. But I will tell you, Martin. other folks, you know, depending on your disability, depending on, you know, what accommodations may or may not be needed in the interview, never mind in the job setting. I don't mean to jump in line of questions, but I, I have to agree. This is Alex Mestahedi um, with Director Xavier. I've been on the other end of that where I was I was on the hiring panel. And, you know, normal standard practice, we ask, you know, the can it wasn't me. It was one of the personnel liaisons asked the candidates, do you need any accommodation? You know, it was just part of the standard script. And that was the way that agency did it. So making no judgment on that. And they said, no, they showed up. Uh, turns out they did. So that actually threw off the entire interviewing process because she had seen the questions ahead of time and there was, it was a lot of special things had to be done because you want to be fair to every candidate. So I have to double down on what you're saying there, Joe, because I've been on the other end of that and it's a partnership. So, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that she had just as fair a chance, but then again, you know, having her come back after the software was available for her gave her an advantage. So I had to like rebalance the questions. It was it was not fun, but I, I agree with you that it, it depends on your own individual slant. But I think that partnership, I really want to double down on that. So yeah. providing more context for you, Eduardo. Okay, thank you. So we are just enjoying this so much that like oh, we have too many, too many questions for you. Mindy asks, I wonder if Joe could expand on what he means by workplace socialization and what we what are the options. So since we do have the use of many technologies, you know, Skype, Teams, Zoom, etc. And then the second question was from um, Robin. Um, do you feel with telework being made available to the pandemic that agencies are going to have a tougher time? Are articulating do undue hardship to um, provide RA? Um, so sorry, two questions at once, Joe. Yeah. So let, let me tackle the last one first. <clears throat> so undue hardship does not get changed because somebody's in telework. Um, at least, at least you know, as a as a sort of a first approach to that. And the undue hardship is in the link to an accommodation the person needs. And so we don't know what that is. So you have to really be able to look at that and again individualize that to the person. But as a broad piece, I don't know that undue hardship would necessarily change uh, just because somebody is going to telework. Okay. And the second part of that, what do we mean by workplace socialization? Well, let me let me share my own personal experience. So all of my life, I have fought to be integrated, to be included, to be feel welcomed, and just be part of every place. The ability to walk down the hallway, pop into somebody's office and say, hey, how was your weekend? How are the kids? You know, what's going on? Hey, how about let's go to lunch? Hey, you got a minute. I'd like to pick your brain about this and that or the other. Um, the person does the same to me. We build that camaraderie. We have the water cooler chat. We have the conversations that occur in the hallways to and from. Um, hey, we're all thinking of going to lunch. You want to go with us? Or, hey, how about you guys? You want to go to lunch? Whatever, right? You have all that. Well, how much of that is occurring in this virtual environment? It's not. So we have to be very intentional about creating this space for those same kind of conversations. Because the last thing that we as people with disabilities want 
is to be isolated again, right? So that's what I mean by workplace socialization. And even though we have the ability to use all the video platforms, I don't know about you folks, but yes, a video chat is much more meaningful than a phone call, but it's not the same as a face-to-face -face conversation. Just not the same, okay? I mean, we're, we're human beings, we're all social creatures. And so that social aspect of us should not and cannot be taken for granted. Um, we're having to be very intentional about creating the space, the opportunity, um, and we're gonna learn a lot over the coming months and, and years about how to do this. Thank you, Joe. Really appreciate your uh, wisdom and the comments and uh, you've been extremely helpful in clarifying a lot of burning questions that many of our SDAC members had. Uh, my question to you is, I know you mentioned the Secretary of GovOps, you mentioned DGS, and then you mentioned all the departments in connection with the telework policy. How does it all reconcile uh, and in a way, what I'm trying to find out logistically, how would that work? Would DGS come up with the main policy and then GovOps will approve it and send it to all the departments? And since you mentioned the departments are uh, unique in their respective functions and programs, how would they then implement their respective policies within the guidance of what GovOps and uh, DGS will come up with? That's my question. So, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so let me start with by saying this is not new because of COVID-19, right? This is something the state has been dealing with for decades and decades. So we here at the Department of Rehabilitation, um, when we looked at establishing our telework policy, we looked at the model policy that was put out by, you know, DGS. And then we went through the process of saying, all right, if this is our start point, what do we need here to make this um, operational, uh, practical, usable, and effective for our department? And you know, we put that in place. Um, we vetted it, we got it approved, and you know, approved meaning, you know, the ex executive leadership agreed. Um, to, to it and got it in place, and then we operationalized it. Um, not much more complicated than that. Now, does that policy look like, I don't know, pick another department? Probably not. But the policy is written for our environment, for the services, the way that we do business, not for the way another department does. I think that would be true about anybody else's policy. And I, here's what I would encourage all of you. You can get caught up in the mechanics of how something happens. But as an advisory body, both at the state level and at the department level, what I would encourage you to think about is what needs to be in the policy so that individuals with disabilities have an equitable opportunity to telework. And that to me is where the focus is. How it happens, I, I would just leave that to the, to the people that need to figure it out. It's what does it need to contain? Yeah. So this is Susan, and I actually completely agree with you. I think um, one of our roles as a part of our local DACs or, our, or the SDAC is as advocates and activists. I mean, I really would call all of us activists, even if it's only internal activists. Mm -hmm. um, and that part of the power that we have is you've just given us a whole bunch of really great information about um, here's this agency and the way they're doing it. 
when we get a copy of that, we now have the power to take that to our agency and say, look, the Department of Rehab has set a baseline. Can we try to emulate this? Can we use this as a guide? Um, and then we can have that conversation. You know, sometimes some agencies may not be able to adapt um, yeah. the same policies that your agency has been able to. Um, but if nobody brings up, starts the conversation, we never get anywhere. Um, so that's me, my personal comment. Yeah. Well said. Well, at this point, we can open it up for any verbal questions that anybody else uh, wishes to pose. And Hi, my name is Elizabeth Huber, and I'm a branch chief at the California Energy Commission and the newly elected um, chair of our um, Disability Advisory Committee. And one, I want to thank you for speaking today. I've already shared your name with our public advisor to be a judge on a uh, a California awards program we're doing. So look for Noami call, you calling you. Okay. But my question is, um, one of the challenges we're having at the Energy Commission, and and I've gone through reasonable accommodations. Um, I have asthma. Um, if we're finding with our staff is the challenge of reasonable accommodations. People will have their doctor's notes, or we are pretty flexible at the commission, but it's the implementation why everybody's remote. And um, so do you suggest we do like Zoom calls or team calls, or do you have staff that actually will go out to somebody's home? How are you guys implementing that right now? Or are you still working up a process that um, could work during this time of COVID? Thank you. I, I think here's what I would start with in terms of what you described, right? The accommodations process um, is an interactive discussion conversation. And so what is necessary for that conversation to take place? Can you, you know, what, I mean, the folks are doing it, video, do it video. They're doing telephone, do a telephone. I think what you get into when you get into this, somebody have to go to the place is, are you having to provide some kind of accommodation at the home that requires some kind of site visit? Okay, that's the question. Now, remember, for us, this is not new, right? We already were doing that. So the, the accommodations process was already in place. Telework was already in place. It just got accelerated, you know, rather quickly in a matter of weeks. Um, more people moving to it, not that any of it was new. But don't lose sight of the basic principles of the interactive process. It's a conversation between the supervisor and the employee. Okay, what are the limitations? Okay, what are the barriers? And what are the mitigating things that we can do? Any other questions? Thank you. Hi, this is Gabe Mayer from the Employment Development Department. The question for you, I, I know that uh, we do a lot of preaching to the choir here because we are all have the same mindset that we are here to, you know, to really look at people as individuals and, and work with people's abilities as opposed to their disabilities. Um, do you have any uh, suggestions or pointers on how we can frame things for management and executives in our department that will help them to see the value in providing these reasonable accommodations? And because everything really needs is a business model, right, for, in a lot of people's eyes. So would you suggest that we really try to look at the end result and the value of giving somebody a reasonable accommodation or, or affording them the accommodation so the bottom line is that they're more productive, there's more business sense to it? I would. Um, I, I mean, I think it's about two things. I think it's clearly... Um, Every person was hired because they brought value to the organization. And to maximize that value, the person needs to be able to effectively do their job, right? I, I don't think anybody would argue with that. And, and to me, it's no different than hiring um, a, quote, non-disabled person um, and saying, well, maybe we'll give you a telephone, maybe we'll give you a computer, maybe we'll give you a desk. We don't even think about that. We provide it because it's needed for the person to do the job. Same thing. Number two, um, this is a California for all. We have a governor that has made that about as crystal clear as could be said. For all means all. 
when we talk about this diversity and equity and inclusion, we're talking about everybody feeling welcomed and belonging in the workplace, right? Um, so we wouldn't dare suggest that um, people who are of color sit over there or don't do this. Or do, hey, this is no different. So yes, the value, absolutely. But don't, let's not forget the person, the humanness. We treat everybody that way. Again, and you heard me say this. Why is it we don't uh, even think twice about providing bathrooms in the workplace or desks or lights? Can you know how much energy we'd save if we didn't have to provide lights for all the sighted people? Okay. So, yes, that's absurd. But frankly, it's what I challenge our folks to think about. So it's shifting that mindset. I really appreciate this. You guys know how to get a hold of me. If there are other questions, you know, send them to me. Be glad to send back, you know, some thoughts on those questions. I will get our telework policy over to you folks. You guys can, you know, have the benefit of that and go from there. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Joe. We really appreciate your attendance and presence here. It's been valuable. So sorry we can't. Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thank be well, you everybody. so much. Bye-bye. Stay safe.